Good day, Dick. Thanks again for agreeing to do this video interview with me. We seem to be doing this in the first quarter of the last three years here, and I really value this because I feel like I'm getting caught up in some of the latest in the research. Our conversation today kind of started back in December when somebody on LinkedIn uh, included me, tagged me on an article and said, you know, what do you guys think of this? And it was the article it was about the applicability of neuroscience to user experience. And you and I have had a couple of exchanges here uh, before doing this. But uh, so we're going to talk a little bit today, as, as you told me, you gave me kind of a, a rough outline here about, you know, what's current, what's the latest, what have you been reading? Because you you know, voraciously uh, consume all the research that's going on. And that's so valuable. I don't do that. Um, but, but so we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence from testing and the evidence from psychology and the evidence from neuroscience. And I've got a couple of questions that I've uh, jotted down here and perhaps we'll uh, segue into one of those in between your conversation or I'll save them to the end. But uh, so, so where do we start? Where, what's going on in the world of research that impacts learning and development? Let me, uh, let, let me begin. The testing part, actually, I want to talk about is the tests that have been done on some of the current motivation models that are out there for work motivation. And uh, the point here, first off, is that there's an incredible amount of evidence that favors a class of motivation models called expectancy control models. So if you Google it, they'll come up. There's a number of them. Uh, Burr Saxberg, at the, um, uh, who's at the uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and I have an article, a couple of articles that we've done on a version of those models that we call the BEC model, B-E-C. And it stands for Belief, Expectancy, and Control. Um, we've done both a research review that's available online uh, in the uh, legacy series, I think at ISPI. And also we have a Harvard Business Review article that summarizes it. So I, I'd like to just briefly describe it because there's some new, very exciting research that's really somewhat as a result of measurement uh, that, that, that enhances it, that shows that it's even more important than any of us thought originally. Excellent. Um, and uh, so before I do that though, let me back up and just briefly describe the model, okay? belief, expectancy, mm -hmm. and control. What it, it starts out with a, measure, with a way to measure motivation. The definition of motivation in these new research models, these expectancy control models is threefold. Motivation is always the uh, starting a task on time to finish it so you meet requirements. Secondly, persisting at the task once you begin, not being distracted, but persisting at it. And third, investing enough mental effort to succeed. And um, uh, it turns out that in all the surveys that are out there these last couple of years, persisting is the biggest difficulty that people have. They're easily misled, they daydream, we daydream, we get fed up with something, we decide we need a change, whatever it is, it's hard to stick with a task. Um, and uh, a lot of people, by the way, claim that that it's not important to persist at a test. You have to multitask is the term. And people are as proud of them. So I've heard people claim they are just terrific multitaskers. But you know, here again, if you just go out and again, get into Google Scholar and, and Google multitasking research, you're gonna find out that it is almost entirely opposed to it. Not only says it doesn't work, people can't multitask, but when you try, it actually causes you problems. You become less efficient, you make more mistakes and so on. And so multitasking, that is failing to persist at a task is not only not helpful, it can be hurtful in your performance of that task and any other that you switch to. So until now, there's sort of, there's a good evidence that there's three things that influence persistence, three things that can help it. Uh, the first thing is that if you can find some way to connect your personal things that you personally feel are important or valuable to the task, not the things that a manager thinks are important, not the things that, uh, that the organization values, but the thing that the individual performing the task values, that people will persist longer. Um, so that, in a way, is thinking about uh, beliefs so in the sense that values are beliefs. The expectancy part of this comes when 
uh, it turns out that it's an expectancy about our ability and whether we'll be able to perform the task adequately or not. Uh, the ideal is to have an expectation that a task is really challenging, but doable, not impossible. So managers that are inclined to give people these tasks that are impossible, thinking people will work harder is a foolish thing to do. They have to believe they can succeed at it. So the problems here are underconfidence. If you don't think you can do it, you're not gonna be motivated. And the, the very less well understood, but more important problem is overconfidence. It's a huge problem because you think you know what you're doing with a task, you're wrong, you don't. But if you screw up at it, you don't take responsibility yourself. You always point the finger somewhere else and that causes a problem because it's hard to control. So those two things, beliefs about the personal value of the task and expectations about whether it's doable or not, whether you're confident that you can do it, those are two important things. The third thing, the control part of it, it turns out to be the ability to control any negative emotions you have about the task. If you're angry, you're frightened, you're anxious, feeling depressed, whatever it is, not just about the task, but about anything, think something going, learn in the pandemic, anybody that's not having negative emotions occasionally is not alive. So bottom line here is that control of emotions is a very big thing. There are strategies for doing it, by the way, and maybe we can talk about a couple a little bit later, but those are the three things we know about that enhance or control persistence. But now there's, this, and, and now I'm moving into the second part, which is something from psychology that's terribly important here. We found a fourth factor. And that fourth factor turns out to be so incredibly important. I, I wasn't prepared for, I don't think anybody was prepared for this. And the fourth factor is, are you ready? It's the ability to control our attention. Now you can see how that's connected to persistence because if you can't control your attention, you're not gonna be able to persist, even though you may desire to, you may have the intention to, but not be able to simply because you don't have the skill to do that because your attention is wandering. And so we have to also learn how to control our attention while we're working. And it requires three things to do that. First thing is just obvious, you gotta stick at a task. Can't go off onto something else. And secondly, you have to ignore all the seductive details out there, the seductive attractions of something else to do, including just the very pleasurable thing of daydreaming. And by the way, it is incredibly pleasurable. If you, <laughs> if you actually put monitors on people when they're tasked, when they're doing a task, and if they start daydreaming, the amount of pleasure that they experience zooms up. Um, and so it's a very seductive kind of you know, alternative to, to working. So we know that those three things are, are, are really important. Um, uh, the third thing is ignoring seductive details is something that we can learn to do a little bit better, but it turns out that there's another thing here. And that is that in order to persist, we've got to be able to hold details of the tasks that we're performing in our mind. We've got to remember where we've been. We've got to remember what we're doing. We have to remember the elements of sermon analyses, I mean, all these kinds of things. There's things called episodic memory. We have a memory that remembers sequences of things. We have sensory memories, what we've done with our hands, with our bodies, what we've smelled, tasted, and so on. That, all that is, there's a separate memory for that. There's something called working memory, which is your thinking, conscious thinking about what's going on. The moment that you stop persisting, you literally cause all those memory patterns to decay about the task you're doing. And if you then have to go back to the task, if it's a momentary lapse of persistence, those things are vaguer or they're gone. And now you've got to reestablish them. So you have reduced both the efficiency and the effectiveness of the task. And when people do this, the evidence is that the number of errors they make on the task absolutely explode. They, they, they really increase dramatically. And this then means that this ability to control attention and to support persisting at a task with it turns out to be one of the most important things I think we've discovered in a long time. Um, 
The reason that it didn't show up on the radar in the past, I think, is while we've known about it for a long time, for example, you know the term attention deficit. Mm -hmm. There are children and adults, actually, who really have a hard time focusing their attention. Um, but what we thought was that the ability to control attention was specific to certain tasks, that some people learn it with some tasks and they can't perform it with others. For example, there was always a saying that kids who get into the computer games learn to control their focused attention on a computer. And that that may be successful for them in other computer kinds of tasks. And there may be, that may, there may be something to that, by the way. But on the whole, we found out that attention control is not specific, it's general. So when you learn strategies that help you control your attention, you can generalize them to a huge variety of tasks without intending to. It just they automatically generalize, apparently. And um, we also have learned, and here's something that totally unexpected, that attention control accounts for about 60% of creative thinking and problem solving. Mm. Um, the way that that's known for anybody that looks at this at the literature on intelligence. It turns out that attention control and fluid ability, which is a test that measures creativity the best, it predicts creativity the best, the correlation between the two is so high, it's like 0.89. It doesn't get much higher than that in psychology. Now, that it is only a correlation, but what it suggests is there's something about, about the ability to, to control attention is highly engaged in this whole notion of being creative. And so that skill, an increase in the skill of attention control may actually contribute to an increase in people's creativity as well as their success on tasks. And this turns out to be really important when tasks are very complex or very critical. Um, and so, and let me just, by the way, stop here for a second, uh, at least interrupt my flow, not on the same task, but interrupt <laughs> my flow with it, uh, and say that the, one of the ways we know about this is pretty unusual story. Um, it has to do with the psychology department at Georgia, Tech, um, Georgia Institute of Technology. I don't know these people. I've read their work, but I don't know them personally. But I am really impressed that different senior psychologists at a at a solid university have all banded together to work on the same problem. I don't know when that happened before in universities. I mean, I've been in a number of different psychology departments with good people who are lovely, cooperative, social people, but they do not work together on things very often, more than in pairs, maybe, and then only for a short time. It looks like seven or eight people in the same department have correlated, have formed a team to do this work. And that's actually exciting because I think that kind of focus, that kind of persistence maybe mm -hmm. in a team effort made a huge difference. Um, and so what we know is that we've got from them a valid and a very reliable measure of attention control. Um, and it's so important, the research on it is so important that the military has actually mo completely modified the armed services vocational aptitude test. Anybody that's been in the military knows what that test is. Everybody mm -hmm. takes it sometimes more than once. And it determines the jobs you're assigned. Particularly if you're a non-com or, or an officer, it, it, it very much determines what schools you go to, what specialties you develop and so on. And so the military has to believe, by the way, it was the Navy that supported this research, the Office of Naval Research is, by the way, one of the best grants anybody can have in a university. I think they ask you for a, a letter once a month to tell them what you're doing. That's about it for the money that you get. But so people tend to do a good job. And this, I think, is a great success on the part of the Office of Naval Research. Military is making use of it. And I'm going to suggest later that I think that it ought to be commoditized. I think a number of people in training and development ought to get involved in this and find a way to implement it. Um, so that's the story from the measurement and from the psychology standpoint about this. And I wanna make one more transition. The third thing that you mentioned was the thing that got me started on this and came to you was over what's going on in neuroscience. 
Now, it turns out there's a connection with all of this in neuroscience. And the connection is that evidence that there are, uh, again, I'm going to back up and ease into this, but there's evidence in neuroscience that the brain has three very critical networks that operate during learning and performance. And uh, those networks are whole networks of areas of the brain that function together to make certain things happen, both in your thinking, your behavior, your memory, what you accomplish, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to describe the three briefly, and I'm going to show how these systems fit into it, or how this, this, uh, uh, this motivation theory fits into it. So the first network, one that we're mostly you know, familiar with, is something called an executive control network. And, and that's active when we're focused externally on a task or something that we're doing. It helps us set priorities, accomplish goals, manage our time, uh, reasoning, consider other points of view as we're making decisions. Um, it helps us ignore distractions uh, because it helps us avoid what you might think of as irrelevant information. And it also, interestingly enough, is uh, one of the things that helps us be flexible in our thinking about stuff. And it finally, it also helps us regulate emotions uh, by uh, disengaging this next network that I'm gonna talk about. And it also helps us to feel less negative by helping us reframe what's happened. In other words, re-explain to ourselves something that happened that upsets us so that the new explanation is both plausible and it also is something that makes us feel a little bit better, which is one of the ways to avoid really strong negative emotions if they're interfering with your life. So here's the next one. The next brain network is called the default mode. I don't know who named it, but it's a default in that your brain always goes there if you're not actively attending to something outside of yourself, like a work task or something you're, you're looking at, something you're interacting with. Now, this default mode is active then when we take a break, when we begin daydreaming, uh, when we become internally focused on our thoughts or our experience, our feelings, our emotions, analyzing how much control we have. Remember part of the issue in, in motivation is always what psychologists call self-efficacy, but really what it is is our confidence about what it is we're trying to tackle. Um, it has to do, it, it, it's very involved in the kind of thinking that we do about what other people are thinking about us or about what's going on. So we kind of, in this default world, we model the minds of other people and what must be going on. And um, people with autism, for example, just don't have access to this part of the default mode currently. And it also has a big thing to do with making moral or ethical judgments. Something we learned that we could do a little bit more with as a society in the last year. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, it's very focused on the loss or the lack of control. It's a kind of negative thing, this default mode. A number of people that do research on it have noticed that it tends to um, be overly sensitive to a, a lack of control, to our not succeeding when we intend to. And it tends to then lead to negative emotions. Uh, the more we feel out of control, the more kind of depressive we feel, the more down we feel. And the more then that we withdraw from what the situation that we feel we're not in control of. That same thing happens with overconfidence. We tend to withdraw there, but because we say, well, this, this is messed up. I know what I'm doing here and it's telling me I don't. So that's, that's the default mode. It is deactivated when we're working on a task. It is only activated when we quit and try to switch to something else. And here's the critical thing that it, when it's act, it, it takes up 90% of all the energy that is used in the brain. And by the way, that's how people in neuroscience judge the importance or the activity in a different area of the brain. How much energy is it taking in at any particular time? How much total energy does it, does it consume? Which implies that 90% of the time we are in the default mode. 
or at least that the default mode itself uses that kind of energy. All right, so that's two, your executive mode, uh, executive control mode and the default mode. Now here's his third one, mystical number three. This third number again is something that people call the salience network. Salience means importance. So it is a network that actually moves, it, it functions as a switcher in the brain. It switches us from the task that we're on to another task that we perceive as much more important. Um, it is constantly looking for value. So this is where the belief about value, the benefit and risk that's involved in the options that we're considering. Um, it's the network that moves us to the default mode if we perceive that, for example, something inside ourselves is more important than something that we're working on at that particular time. Uh, and it's really, really an important system, even though it's simple because it's only looking for our beliefs about what's valuable out there, uh, but it's gonna determine whether we persist at the mode or not, which is why values are really important. So you see how we've gotten back now to the three things that influence uh, persistence. Mm -hmm. We've got the value, we have the, the expectancy about how capable we are, and we have emotion control, the need for it, which happens in the executive control process. And finally, we have the key that binds all these things together, both the emotional and the affective part of motivation being emotions and value and so on, and the more cognitive part, which means the reasoning that we do about something to, to accomplish a task, it is this ability to control our attention. So it becomes the keystone to me, the, the link that ties together all of these things. Now, as a result of all this, I think there's some suggestions here for l and I think there's some things that we can do or that we should be thinking about doing in the future First of all, I think everybody ought to consider taking a look at these um, expectancy control motivation models. Uh, you'll find them that focus on value. You'll find them that focus on self-efficacy. You'll find them that focus on emotions. That's getting more and more popular. Uh, we tried to find one, we tried to develop one that focuses on all three of those things. So if you want the Beck model, that's one of the ways to look at it. There are others out there. And to me, what it suggests that it's critical to connect work to people's personal values, to their beliefs about their, their ability, to, their, to, to how capable they are at controlling the emotions, the more negative emotions that they experience that take them away from performance. And I think it's extremely important to begin looking carefully at how to measure people's ability, general ability, to control their attention. And next, to begin to look at the studies that these guys at, at Georgia Institute of Technology have done to see what kinds of strategies they found that were very effective for people to, to control their attention. That's my next, that's what I'm doing next week is I'm looking at all of, I'm trying to pull them out of all the studies out of their descriptions of the uh, interventions that they implemented and the surveys that they've done and try to make a list about what were the most important things. And this whole business about measuring people's ability to control their attention is really vital. Uh, they have developed measures, but my guess is they need to be made more user friendly uh, more adaptable to general populations, particularly work in work settings. And I think here's an opportunity for commoditizing something. Now you're going to measure out there and do, you know, reliability and validity tests on it and make it available. I'm, and, you know, think about it. If the military is using it for selection, why can't corporations use it for selection? It, it's not just for the military. It's one trait built into a number of others that are important. I don't wanna make this thing most important of anything, but it certainly is hugely critical, particularly in complex jobs. Because complex jobs are always complex because there is novelty involved. 
And the more novel it is, the more you need this ability to deal with highly novel problems. And apparently, the ability to control your attention is one of the best predictors of that ability. So a uh, bottom line is that's kind of it. And what I think we've accomplished here is to begin to tie all these things of cognition and motivation together and see where they turn and they turn both strongly on this issue of the ability to control attention. This is fascinating. Fascinating. So, so do you, you intrigue me here with this, how to control attention? I mean, you can select for that people who already have it, but if, you know, if there aren't enough people in the marketplace or available to you and you need to develop people's ability to control their attention, you said you're going to look at that next week, but what have you learned so far about that? What was Well, the, the, the right people at, at, at Georgia Institute of Technology say that they, they think they, there's evidence that you can develop it. Now, how much you can develop it, I think, may be the issue, because it appears that some people are born with more of it. Okay. Uh, and some people are born with less of it. That's what's important. Remember, I mentioned... Uh, this whole business of attention deficit. Yeah. It's possible that people that are diagnosed with attention deficit, and there is a good test for that, mm -hmm. um, may have been born with less of it. But the fact that they were doesn't mean they can't learn how. Yeah. And I think that's exciting because it's not often the case that a general ability like intelligence can be increased. A lot of people have tried that. They're still trying. There's people that claim they've done it. They're wrong. They haven't. I'm sorry. Uh, but it's possible that this attention thing can be influenced and can generalize. I hope. Let's look wow. for it. Let's try. Right. I think that uh, all of it. I mean, we're, we're in, live in a world now where there is just constant uh, distractions. And as we as we discussed a little bit before I hit the record button here on this, I I was having, uh, I wrote a blog post just earlier th this past week and about the chat areas in like webinars and such and on the Zoom meeting here. We don't have that turned on here because it's just the two of us, but but I usually, I tell people that I, I don't look at that. I don't even turn it on. Uh, I'll have a moderator, you know, take track the questions and comments that people have and then summarize that when I get to certain key uh, points where I want to handle questions. Otherwise, it throws me off if I get distracted and have to answer something, it'll take me off my train of thought. But when I've asked to look at the uh, chat notes to see you know, what were people saying throughout the whole webinar, I'll see that there's a lot of things that are off target. They're just saying hello to each other. Oh, I haven't seen you in a while and, and catching up and doing all these social interactions, which means they're not listening to me, which maybe that's justified. Uh, but, but, it's, but when we encourage or allow or enable that, people may gravitate to those kinds of interactions for whatever, whatever needs that they have for that, but it takes them away from the message. They're, you know, I'm not teaching a skill in a webinar, I'm creating awareness or maybe a little bit of knowledge, um, but it's, you know, it, it's required. <laughs> I'm usually not talking about very simple things, I'm talking about things that are somewhat complex and if you're missing part of that, then why are you even there unless it's for social reasons rather than learning reasons? So no, I think those those things are a bad mistake. Those chat things. I stopped using them years ago also because it just it's a distraction. If if there if there are questions, if you if you're giving a talk and you want to be interrupted, and somebody mm -hmm. does interrupt you and ask a question, it's usually relevant to what you're talking about. At least you have a hope that's the case. Right. And if that's the case, then it, it helps you in, in, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm, I'm starting to wonder whether doing this kind of an interview on information doesn't sort of provide a whole lot of distraction that's irrelevant to the message that's coming out, that actually adds cognitive load, it's called now, to people that are trying to understand. I actually prefer to read something because I can focus on it because it's usually more organized and so on and so forth. 
But there are people that really like this, and it's because I think there's a more positive emotion for them in what appears to almost be an interaction. And that may be one of the benefits of the chats for people that are actually watching, not for the person giving the talk. Because if you're distracted by questions or comments that are coming up in a chat to decide, that's going to interrupt that. You're not going to be able to persist very well to talk to you. So I think there are a lot of issues about what does overload people cognitively. One of the key issues here is, I think one of the more depressing things I've learned about our minds is that our working memory is such a small space. It has very little space for information. Uh, we used to say seven plus or minus two things to be thought of at one time, and it's not the case. It's it's three plus or minus one or two. And so if you can only hold three things in your mind at once, three ideas, three points. Um, and if you're anxious, by the way, that number decreases. If you if you're, have a negative emotion, it makes it much more difficult. If you're trying to do more things at once, they disappear, as I said. And so uh, you really have to keep things simple. That KISS principle, keep mm -hmm. it simple, stupid, mm -hmm. is so important in what we do. If you want people to carry away the information that, that's being given in training or in any kind of presentation, kissing it is critical. I think I'm guilty of uh, not kissing it, maybe perhaps uh, offering too much too quickly. Uh, I, I try to hopefully stay away from seductive details and things that aren't really relevant to what I'm trying to convey, but, but, that's, but that's difficult. So uh, chunking content and giving people some time to work with it, you know, a webinar that's 60 minutes, 90 minutes long doesn't, uh, doesn't afford you much opportunity to give people a chance to process the information, internalize it, determine what their own questions are and, and give those back to the presenter. So I, I, so perhaps this whole notion of webinars or MOOCs or anything that's just one longer continuous set of, of information, perhaps that's what we need to avoid. You know, uh, a few years ago, three or four now, uh, John Sweller and Paul Kirshner and I wrote an article on the review of the research on how important it was to be step by step as you are teaching people how to do something, how to, mm -hmm. how to demonstrate each step in sequence, how to give people a chance to practice and get the corrective feedback as they're trying to apply it in a hopefully a realistic context of, and so on. That is the most cited article in educational research now in the world. Wow. And yet, I, as I review the citations, a lot of them simply say, well, we don't agree with this at all. Hmm. We think discovery learning of some kind. And, oh. uh, you know, just giving people a problem in a group and telling them to solve it. That's what mm -hmm. teaches people to solve problems and to, to perform. So th there's a huge bias against it out there. And these biases are really hard to overcome. Uh, and that's one that we need to actually do some work on. Because if you're teaching people how to do something, they have to see it done. They have to see it done step by step, all the actions, all the decisions they have to make and when they have to make them and how to make them. And they have to have a chance to practice it and get corrective feedback on it. And the way that feedback is given also turns out we know that feedback that you're wrong, you're stupid, you, this is ridiculous, yada, yada, that doesn't help. It just interferes with people's performance. The best feedback is, let's take a look at the strategy where you were using right here, because there may be a more effective twist on that strategy. Let me describe what it is. People will believe that they use their own strategy, but they have such a hard time accepting that they personally were wrong. Uh, now that people overcome it, people learn how to deal with it, uh, diff different people in different ways, but that doesn't mean that it's helpful. It never is helpful, apparently. Well, let, let me shift here slightly to 
from a learning and development design perspective, you know, we talked a little bit earlier again before we started this recording about uh, um, advanced organizers and learning objectives in particular. Um, and one of the things that you had said is, you know, I was asking about the difference between what what uh, learning objectives I might give the developer who's going to create the content as if I was a designer versus what I would want to confront the target audience, the learners with, you know, and the, you know, keep it simple mm -hmm. is one thing. And if there's a lot of them, then you kind of spoon feed them a little bit in, in, in segments uh, and give it to them that way. But so starting kind of at the top, when if you establish your, your objectives, um, what's the lesson here for uh, when you're when you're giving an advanced organizer and giving people objectives and are you trying to encourage them that you know that they can do this uh, to help link to their prior knowledge so they feel like okay they're not starting from ground zero or or you know below the ground level that they're that they know some of this already how you know so that's important I'm taking it what what's the best strategy for setting that up what's the most efficient effective way well, i think the rule with advanced organizers is that you're better off to keep them as simple as you can but yet cover the field i and you know nothing if you have 10 advanced organizers what's to prevent you from giving them in groups of three or mm -hmm. four rather than just landing on people all of a sudden uh so and 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 not long involve things unless you have to. The more, the, more, the, the more succinct you can make them, the more helpful it is to people out there. You know, most of us have been trainers mm -hmm. and, and some of us teachers also. And we tend to remember the, the trainees or the students that were really bright, really capable, that picked things up really fast, that were enthusiastic about what we're doing. What we don't focus on and what more difficult to remember are all those people who we cause difficulty learning because of the way we presented something. The, the, one of the really difficult things about life is that the brighter the people are, the more quickly they memorize things. I mean, wow. I've known some genius people in universities before who never forgot anything they ever read or heard mm -hmm. or, or listened to you know, in, in conversations. I could tell you about conversation you'd have with them 20 years ago when you didn't even remember you had the conversation. So we remember, we, we tend to think that students and trainees are more capable than they really are. Judging them by the top people is not helpful. You have to be thinking about the average or even below average because only the people who don't need the training or the education benefit from piling a lot of information on them and letting them go and learn it for themselves. They don't need to be there in the first place. You're, you're there as a trainer and as a developer, a designer to help the people who are going to be struggling the most and make them successful. Have you done much exploration with uh, augmented reality or virtual reality, you know, where we can, you know, take a person through a firefighting exercise and, and, yep. and simulate all of the, it doesn't that, does that yeah. is the danger you know what I'd like introducing to do? I'd like to do a session on something that people call unlearning okay that's a big topic right now in psychological research and what it means is that in your lifetime particularly people who are let's say not kids just starting out anymore but even there there's difficulties and people at the middle level of their careers have learned a whole lot of things early in their careers that they've automated. They've, they've learned strategies that just become part of them they don't even think about. They just, when certain cues happen in their environment, that's what they do. That's what they say, that's how they act. And they kind of think they decided to do it, but the evidence is pretty strong from neuroscience again, that they didn't decide at all. It was just automatic, okay? So if you have negative things, for example, I tended to get temperamental in my career with people who I thought were just not paying attention and off someplace. Uh, and, and it wasn't helpful. Uh, so finding that out about yourself is an opportunity to unlearn that, to stop doing it. And in order to do it, you actually have to go through some very specific kinds of approaches. 
The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative funded a workshop of the best researchers in the world here a while ago at USC to look at this problem about unlearning and to try to figure out what we knew about it. So I'm getting back to virtual reality. Mm -hmm. It turns out that one of the most powerful strategies for unlearning things that are distressing to people, for example, people in the military who've been in, who, you know, or people who've been in very dangerous situations who come out with, well, PTSD, actually, yeah. post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and, and things that are highly emotional that you use as automated reactions, the best way to get rid of them turns out to be virtual reality. Simulating similar events in virtual reality and then finding a way to let yourself kind of dissipate your reaction to them. Hmm. Pretty powerful stuff. So reliving it, but with some office. Right, right. It's simulating the situation that has the cues in it that brings in this negative stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in virtual reality very effectively. And then when those cues are there, if you can interrupt the, the, the statement and replace it with something else. Hmm. Uh, for example, mindfulness or, you know, uh, there's a variety of strategies for PTSD. It makes a huge difference. And I think we can generalize this to almost everything in, that we have to unlearn as we go forward. And we're just beginning to realize how large a list of things that it is. Would, 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 that in, would this uh, virtual reality include me being able to control and stop the process, the experience, yeah. need to so I can yeah. get through yeah. versus Fair. me just oh. I mean being some of the studies that, that have gone on at USC um, have have done that they've had people actually generate their own versions of virtual reality there's mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. that will do that now and just as effective sometimes more effective I'm not sure where I where I read this or where I picked it up but I, I was worried about virtual reality being used in, you know, in too often in that in that the seductive details of, of the real world would distract from what I need to focus on. What, what, what kind of, what is there in the research that says the warnings about uh, virtual reality? And well, if you're going to simulate something you're learning to do, mm -hmm. then and, and virtual reality allows you to contextualize that to make it look like a setting that's similar to where you're going to be performing those tasks. Why wouldn't that be effective? I mean, I, but, but if virtual reality actually just simply puts a lot of seductive details on the screen, that's not going to be helpful at all. Those details ought to be things that are relevant to where the task is being performed or where you actually do what it is you're trying to stop doing. I was, uh, I, back in the 80s, I saw a, a simulation, uh, or a, a series of three simulations that took somebody into an experience. And I, you know, you know how the memory works better than I do. But so my takeaway memory from this all these decades later was that the first simulation didn't, it's like being in a, a, an airline cockpit. Only a dozen lights were on and flashing, and I learned how to do whatever I needed to do in this. I kind of think of this had to do with the nuclear uh, operators and their, their stations, but, but I'm not positive about that anymore. And then the next simulated I went into had more lights flashing so that I was incrementally brought into full authentic environment where all the lights and buzzers and things were going off. And I knew what to pay attention to by then. I wasn't confronted with that initially. So I was kind of ramped up into that. Um, you know, I worry sometimes that, you know, the, 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 the shiny object, the virtual reality that we can create, we might create that when it's not really necessary, when you know, a laminated job aid might have been just as uh, uh, effective and much more efficient than creating uh, this a, a simulation of virtual reality thing, just like games uh, are sometimes have too many details that, that can be distracting initially, I, I think. 
um, and that I should be walking, if I'm going to gamify anything, it should be something that's really authentic performance. I should be getting, you know, have a scoreboard and compete against others doing the actual real job tasks or as close to the real job tasks and maybe incrementally going from, you know, simplified situations to something a little bit more advanced to something that's, you know, full blown from Hades, you know, the world's on fire and now what do you do? Um, but, but so I, I'm, I'm very interested in this motivation theory as you've articulated this and the brain networks and, and how this need to control our attention to avoid getting distracted. I mean, we have our phones buzzing and ringing. I, you know, turn my phone off before we uh, uh, did this here. And if it wasn't my watch going off, I wouldn't have known that you were emailing me or calling me uh, before we started. Um, because I just, I, I get sucked in by all these distractions and I've got to, you know, try to focus and I've got to try to reduce noise and all those kinds of things so that I can focus. But so it'd be very interesting. I think if we could learn how to train people, teach people on how to increase their uh, ability to control their own attention so that they are. No, there's, there's one other thing going on here that I didn't talk about that I'm looking into. And mm -hmm. that is, uh, there's a neuroscientist, actually, that I knew at USC, who's internationally famous now. Her name is Mary Helen Imardino Yang, a hyphenated name, Imardino Yang. And Mary Helen uh, is interested in children and their motivation and how to encourage them to sort of see the world more widely. She has used this attention stuff and has gotten children to write stories about their lives and their communities that try to link uh, all of these things together, to link their learning, their cognition about things and the motivation that they have and so on. And she's found some pretty interesting things about the development of the brain by getting kids to write stories about them. Well, to me, that re relates to what you were talking about, what we were talking about with virtual reality, because virtual reality is creating a visual auditory story about something in a, in mm -hmm. a background often. But she gets them to write them in words on paper, and she's followed kids for years and notes ha has good evidence about how much intellectual growth they experience when they do these things. She's got a specific approach to that. And uh, I, there's an article uh, that she's written about it uh, that I'll send to you if you like. You can post it if people want to take yes. a look at it. Because anybody teaching kids, I think, ought to have some idea because she's pretty specific about the kinds of stories she gets them to write. And these are elementary, these are early elementary kids. So we're not talking about high school kids who I think of as more adults. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's exciting, that's, that's going somewhere. And that means to me that finally, I think neuroscience has kind of evolved to the point where it deserves to be called psychology because it's dealing with real world problems that people have. And it's not only dealing with them in terms of what happens in the brain, but how to make it happen. And that's what we're looking for here, I think. Excellent, thank you. So so before we wrap up, can I shift from, we were, we were talking about how we might you know, kick off a, a lesson, if you will, with advanced organizers and learning objectives and such, but can we shift into practice and feedback. We, we talked a little bit about feedback and that's it's interesting that uh, that was a, a theme on uh, Twitter this past week, uh, different types of feedback and when you might use that. But uh, what, what does the research share with us when we're doing complex tax, tasks um, and practice and feedback? How do we, how should, how, you know, what's, What's the lessons from research in terms of how instructional designers should design practice with feedback? Well, you know, there's a, uh, there's a landmark study on feedback that not many people pay attention to. It's landmark for a variety of reasons. First of all, it covered a huge number of studies. It sort of summarized them. And it looked specifically at the issue of whether there were different cultural twists on feedback. Because a lot of people claim that feedback has to be different where people have certain cultural backgrounds. Uh, it was by two guys named Kluger, K-L-U-G-E-R, and Denisi, an Italian named D-I, 
N-I-S-S-I. Um, years ago, but it's been replicated. And the quick bottom line in their review was that there were kind of three types of feedback that most feedback grouped itself into one of three different categories. And two of the, one of those categories made performance worse after you gave feedback that way. And that category was, you're wrong. That was a mistake. Uh, let me tell you what you did wrong about that. Another kind of feedback made no difference at all. That was sort of everything that didn't. And it, there was no way to necessarily categorize that. It was not so clear. It was just everything else. And there was only one kind of feedback that, that enhanced learning and performance. And that was the feedback that I described earlier, which was, you know, at this point where you were practicing, where you were applying what you just learned, you did this thing, or at this point where you were taking this quiz, you'd answered this way. And I think the strategy you were using at that point was this kind of strategy. And I want to suggest uh, an improvement in that strategy. If you only did this other thing, I think next time you tackle something like that it would be a lot more effective. So if the focus is on the task and what the performance was, what the strategy and the, behind the performance was, and not on the person who didn't do what they should have done. Mm -hmm. just, uh, that's pretty. That's pretty compelling. I think. Mm -hmm. Often I've seen, and I've done this myself, unfortunately. Now that I'm coming clean on this, but uh, I've set up practice sessions, a series of practice sessions, so that people can get feedback, will shape their behavior, and hopefully improve them on the next go round. But because of limitations in terms of you know who I had to do feedback and trying to work a, a bunch of people in parallel, if I have three people sitting in a little group, two of them doing the exercise. One of them is the key person doing the exercise. The other one's providing the fodder for, you know, if it was a, if it was a, a, a union steward meeting with the supervisor making complaints and you're trying to train the supervisor on labor relations and having a third person there be an observer to document what they saw, who did what, what they said, to, to provide feedback to the person on what they did. It, it seems that that person wouldn't have been trained they, unless part of the training was here's the various strategies and giving you feedback. I didn't see you using that strategy that the instructor uh, inspected. So what issues are there when, when you're having a, a relative novice giving feedback to people? You know, is there no credibility? Because I know that that person is an, a student just like me. And so should I take, or, or, or is there some value in them simply reflecting and talking about what was taught if there were three key strategies and guy you didn't use any of the three let alone all three which might have been suggested or something um what danger is that i mean how can learning and development people do a better job with creating you know authentic practice with feedback in their uh instruction in their learning so that you know people have more confidence in their ability to do something when they go back to the job so that something will transfer back to the job and have an impact. I, I think you can train novices to do about the topic that's being presented to do adequate feedback. Mm -hmm. In the future, my guess is that it'll be artificial intelligence that'll be given feedback to people during their performance because yeah. it's so much easier to do that. But uh, for example, um, Ken Yates and I, um, had faculty appointments in surgery for about 12, 13 years, and we trained surgeons. And uh, we always had to have a physician with us because we didn't have MD degrees. But those physicians generally would tell us afterwards, gee, I learned a lot and you know, never interrupted or had to. So we learned how to give feedback to, to surgeons who are learning a new surgery. And sometimes they were both complex and surgeries where there'd been a lot of trouble, where, you know, where there'd been a lot of injury and people that hadn't recovered very fast. And we did it because we learned how, because we had been involved, I guess, in the design. I'm thinking out loud now. Now we had been involved in the design of the instruction and we knew the strategies that they needed to be using. And we knew what they needed to be doing with the equipment that they were using. And we kind of could, pretty much pick up what they didn't do and why. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
uh, actually turned out to be really important when we were giving feedback to a lot of variety of surgeons who were learning the same surgery. We learned a great deal about why problems were happening in some hospitals and not in others. You know, for example, vets hospitals, people come into them with very much more serious problems that need surgery than in an upscale hospital in a wealthier neighborhood. And so surgeons that actually work in one place or another get a really different idea about how to treat a problem that comes in the door. And so if you look at the two kinds of hospitals, you'll find that the problems that are noted, and by the way, the best thing about working in surgery, the reason we work there is because the law requires that every time a mistake is made in surgery, it has to become a matter of record. So we knew who was doing surgery as well and who wasn't, and that really helped in terms of both task analysis and in training. And so the bottom line was that it was in the feedback process that we began not only to learn how to do the best training, but also learn how the training might be improved. What we had to focus on in certain contexts in order to keep problems from happening in that context. So feedback's a really critical issue here, I think, not just for learning, but also for, uh, for, for increasing success in training. And I think I changed my mind that you do have to have some knowledge of the material in order to do adequate feedback. Yeah, it has to be. At, at least if it requires that you describe the strategy that was being used mm -hmm. that could be modified in a certain way to make it more effective. Yeah, because nov novice or a rookie giving, especially if it's, I guess, you know, complex, if it's fairly simple, straightforward, less of a problem. But if you're doing anything complex, you really need an expert to... Yep. on the strategies and tactics to do that. And you know, it should be complex for most people. And there's the problem. All, all trainees don't have the same background in the field that they're being trained in. Mm -hmm. And so what's perceived as challenging to one trainee might not be to another at all. And it is really critical that people believe that they're going to have to work to succeed, but they can do it. And then if in addition, they believe that they value what they're doing that's you know you're you're up on top there in terms of motivation and learning i think thank you so let's let's wrap here with uh, uh an update on what's going on with uh, cta cognitive task analysis well we actually got through the first there's two parts to the ai version that we're we're developing uh -huh. first part is to be able to capture step-by-step -step procedures uh, and that includes decisions and the criteria for making the decisions. And I, we believe that we've got the first workable version of that. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing right now is uh, it's going to go online soon and we're going to invite people to get on and use it and break it if they can. You know, just, just a usability thing. Right. Uh, there's a whole second part to this that we haven't done yet and that needs to be there. And that is to begin to determine what kind of declarative knowledge people need to do tasks. What kind of facts, concepts, what processes, you know, how things work do they need to know? What, what principles, cause and effect are they gonna need to know in order? And the purpose of declarative knowledge in most, um, most performance is that it helps you both understand why you're doing the step-by-step -step stuff and it helps you modify it, this procedure you've learned, this, this sequence of activities that usually accomplish the goal when you get stuck. Because in certain contexts, things are not, things are not the same in all contexts where you use a particular set of skills. And you, you often have to jury rig a way around a problem that you did not anticipate. And this jury rigging happens only in a successful way if you have the declarative knowledge that supports that task. So we've got to figure out how to do an AI version that will collect, that will collect the declarative knowledge that experts use who have worked in many different, uh, applied what they know in many different contexts by themselves. That, that's our next struggle. And we don't Is think it? we have the funding to finish that. So we're gonna be oh. out looking for more funding. So I would have thought that the declarative knowledge would have been much easier to, 
I don't know, get, identify or gather? And wh why is that the, the, you know, the facts and processes you need? Isn't it easier to derive that if you understand yeah. the procedure yeah. people are going through? Yeah, we, we, and of course you can start out with relatively simple uh, procedures to begin to build the program and then add more complexity as you go along. Is it because uh, the contexts are different? And so that's the, that's the tricky part of this is that one, you know, a dozen. Oh, you mean why is the declarative knowledge more difficult? Yeah, to gather. Yeah, yeah, and and also, it it it's, it takes a lot of intuition. You have to you have to teach the AI system to recognize a fact and how that's different from a concept, and how a concept is different from a process, and how that's different from a from a principle. Mm -hmm. um, and when is what's being done? covered by a principle or not? And what's the principle? What's the process that this is part of? You know, how does this whole thing work on a larger scale? Uh, th those are, for us, for human beings, those are much easier than they are for teaching a computer how to do that. Okay. Nobody has ever tried this before. Hmm. The people that we have now as AI specialists by the way, we've had to completely change our staff. I mean, uh, we started out, we had to throw out the first year of work because while we, everybody did their best and did what they could, it took developments that had occurred during that year to teach us that we really need to go a different way. So we had to toss everything out and start over again, which is fine. I mean, something new like this, it's always yeah. a learning process. But uh, we have learned a lot about the complexity of the human brain and reasoning about conscious declarative knowledge. It's difficult. You know, anything you can automate is always procedural and you can describe it in great detail. You don't automate concepts, processes, principles, and so on. You, you, those are very, very difficult things to determine, which is why most education is about learning those things about different fields and different settings. Thank you. Well, I, I'm looking forward to our next get together here and capturing your thoughts and what you're learning and being able to share that with others. Um, we need to catch up after you uh, uh, do your next set of research on what's going on over at Georgia Tech. And uh, but maybe it's not gonna be time to uh, do a video on that right away, but uh, but I'd like to hear about that for sure. Thank you, me too. I'm looking forward to finding out what these guys are doing. And I'm deeply impressed with them. I just want to do a shout out to those guys. <laughs> They're terrific. <laughs> and I, by the way, I hope other psychology programs in the country take a, take a message from them, takes a page from them, what they've done. Mm -hmm. We could only get really top people to actually team together on a focused outcome. This is what grants try to do but it's discouraged by the way that status is assigned to top people in a field. You don't get status for a team effort. You get status for individual or sometimes a pair of uh, you know, two people that work together on something who are both well known. Isn't so, that always the case? I mean, in research and in, in corporate life as well. It's, <clears throat> You don't get uh, credit for the team effort, uh, even if you carry the team on your back, unless you're a Walter Payton type. Of... This is a big issue right now, I think. Uh, you know, the question is about what's our country about? Is it individual freedoms or is it some kind of a community sense of where we're going together? Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you divide your time between those two things? Because we put huge impact on individualism and I'm with it. But we need to actually maybe put a little bit more focus on collectivism and how we get together and make decisions about where we're going, how we settle our differences as individuals and groups and so on. Yeah, so true, so true. Okay. Thank you, Dick, for your time today. Uh, thank you again for all you do. Oh, really. you're welcome. Guy. All right. Take Cheers. Care.